recording now. And I share screen. So, um, well, it says what it says on the tin. Um, set of talks on geometric algebras um, makes no prerequisites for the viewer. And so to make this C course. Uh, and it, indeed, it would be suitable for anybody who has a gap in the air or just wants to revitalize their knowledge. Talks will be given by myself and others, and we'll cover the relevant stuff. I mean, there is a huge amount of stuff. Um, so, uh, I I will probably make mistakes and you must tell me when I do because a year ago I knew nothing, but um, in having chats with uh, Steve Budden, Sam Monaco, Luke Kaufman, Brian Sanderson, and uh, this is what we seem to put together. Um, the object was to look for not invariants. That's the main thing, but there's all sorts of lovely mathematics on the way. Um, let's this page. So a bit of history. Um, so Herman Grassman, first person. Uh, 1844, so halfway through the 19th century, and he was thinking of here describing geometric properties using transformations of space, and he wrote the first papers on the subject. Uh, the next person, in fact, I mean, the two major people are Grassman and Clifford, and um, he was trying to formulate uh, alternian algebra from all sorts of directions. He thought of the quaternions as describing certain transformations, rotors, whereas Grassman's algebra described certain properties, length, area, volume. Uh, his contribution was to define a new product, a geometric product, on an existing Grassmann algebra. Grassmann algebra being alternating algebra. And the idea is that you put in, a, if you like, you put in a metric, you take the Grassmann algebra and you put in a metric, and that's what the geometric algebra. Now, um, you can stop me at any time if you don't understand anything or if you think I've got it wrong. Um, and you can criticize me for going too fast, but you can't criticize me for going too slow. So, who are the other people? There's Lipschitz, Gibbs, Clark Maxwell, one of my one of my heroes, Scottish, and Heaviside. Well, I had to mention Heaviside with a name like that. This is a wonderful name. Um, Bile, Cartan. I don't know why he's not involved. It should be. And if you read this paper by Tia Bott and Shapiro on Clifford modules, um, then that's um, that's a seminal paper, and don't forget Gauss. He probably invented uh, turnings himself. Okay, so uh, let's make a definition of a geometric algebra. So, what do we 
ini. <coughs> we need a field F characteristic not two. So it could be reals, complex numbers, integers, mod P, where P is an odd prime, and an indexing set I. I usually take it to be integers one, two, up to N, and a function from the indexing set to um, the non-zero elements. So those are the three ingredients is all you need and then the geometric algebra with field f and map q vector space over f with basis ei one generator for each i in the indexing set and multiplication defined by this so um let me see. What does this mean? It means that, for instance, E1 times E2 minus E2 times E1 and squared is Q1. So that's what this refers to. So this is an algebra definition. Um, and come in. Oh, that's a very, very simple definition. It's just But as we know, by QI, Roger, by QI, you mean the value of Q on I then? I do. That's okay. Okay. Thank you. So, what we Q, can Q be any function or does it have to have some special it, properties? Nope. As long as it's non zero. That's the only okay. thing. Okay. So, this is just, just notation. But, um, you have that Q's quadratic in, is that just an example? That's just a word. Okay. Ah. If, if you like, you can, you could say it's the diagonal quadratic um, function with Q's, Q, Q1, Q2, et cetera, down the diagonal. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. I mean, I'm so it's. <laughs> E, e2 squared is not necessarily four. No. Okay. In general, qi will be a root of unity. Um, I mean, traditionally, it, it's either one or minus one. But there's no reason why it shouldn't be i or minus i. Trying to keep, you know, Keep options open. Okay, and as I say, this is a very simple definition, and uh, but we all know as mathematicians that simple definitions can lead to great complications. Let's give an important example. Q now is just one, all right? Always one and pi is to say the integers uh, one up to n. Let's write that with G A F. This has dimension two to the n and a basis EI where I is a subset of I. <coughs> so let's say they're in order. EI one is less than EI two. K then E suffix big I is its product here. Okay. In particular, G A three R has real dimension eight. 
and tells us all we need to know about the world we live in. So, I've, you've probably heard you know, popular expositions of physics say, actually, the dimension of the world is eight. If, like me, you thought, oh, wow, okay. But it's, it's nothing, nothing amazing. It just happens to be that two cubed is eight. Not, nothing mysterious. Okay, so as an algebra, it's got these generators, <coughs> e1, e2, and three. And these are the relations, e1 squared, etc. is one, ei times ej is minus ej. I, phi is not equal to j. And it's the sum of four orthogonal vector spaces. GA naught is just the field, R, um, and GA1, GA2, and GA3. And they're generated, GA1 is generated by E1, E2, E3. GA2 is E1, E2, E3. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and GA3 has got one generator, E1. One, two, three. And they're isomorphic to the following well known algebras. So GA0, as I said, is isomorphic to R. GA0 plus GA1 is isomorphic to 2 by 2 Hermitian matrices over the complex numbers. Um, so I don't know if I can write that down. Um, so the um, take the St. Louis final design. Um, if I take, what are the generators of these permission commercial well, it's the identity, and there's this one, these are the matrices. This one is usually right. Have I got that right, Lou? Anyway, if I take linear combination of these general matrix, which is B. Minus e. This is sometimes called the Pauli vector, and it will be unitary. So, so that's uh, the first lot. GA0 plus GA2 is isomorphic to the quaternion algebra H. Um, this dot um, I is two. J is E2 plus E3, and then IJ is K, plus E2 plus E1. So there's the quaternions, and finally, G, A0 plus G, so is isomorphic to C, because we take its generator, which is kind of like a volume. Square it. One, two, three, two, three. Um, 
So we get E1 back to here, so minus plus, so that's plus two, three. E2 back to here, we get minus sign. So it's square. So, uh, the whole world is here. Um, everything you need to do to, um, to pack your tools eight dimensional algebra. So far, we've given um, the definition as an algebra. Generators of the algebra. Let's look at it from the point of view of vector space. Uh, we can always assume that i is totally ordered, and we can multiply finite subsets of i. And let's call a set of finite subsets through e. So we have a basis e suffix a, where a is a finite subset. One to one corresponds to the e. And the function q can be extended to a product in a. The value is called the weight of a, otherwise, let's set that to y. Now, how do we define this multiplication of subsets? Remember the symmetric difference of subsets. So it's you take the union and then you take away the intersection. And then the product of basis elements, EA times E is E of the symmetric difference with a factor. And the factor tau E is a sine eta and the weight of the intersection of A. So, <clears throat> this is the product of a sign and a weight. Now, uh, here's the first exercise. Show that this product is associative, if and only if, because we haven't said it, the, I mean, we haven't, haven't said it's the multiplication is associative. <laughs> I mean, I've just made a definition. You have to prove that it's associative. Um, what do you mean by the sign of the pair of subsets? Well, uh, I'm just saying that if you work that out, I mean, try a few examples, you'll get a sign and, and a Q. That, that's the sign there. Okay, because Q is always Q times Q, you know. Q is always one, it's always positive. Minus. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Anyway, this this factor here, this makes the product associative if and only if this equation occurs. Okay, so a little exercise for you. And the theorem is that the single definition, which I gave earlier as an algebra, and this subset definition are the same. Another little exercise to show that they anti commute in this sense EI times J, EJ times EI minus That's that. Toes. Roger, your sound is breaking up for some oh, reason. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. What happens if I, is that better? Yeah, is that, yeah, I think so. Okay, I'm just holding on to the microphone now. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, the, the, so we can grade this algebra, okay? So GAK is the subspace of GA generated by the elements which have length K. 
So they're called k vectors, and ga in general is the sum of these, naught, one, two, etc. The even dimensions, gae, uh, naught, two, and four, etc., is that forms a subalgebra, quite an important subalgebra. Uh, elements of GA naught, this is F, are called scalars. If the top rank is N, then elements of GAN are called pseudo scalars, because they're also one dimensional. If I is, or oh, iota is the generator, generator of the pseudo scalars, then the map X times XI defines a linear isomorphism between GAK and GAM minus K, sort of um, Frankery duality. And they both have dimension NK, of course. N choose K. The space of one vectors is often denoted by V. Notation. Right, are you with me so far? Now, What's the twisted tensor product? So I take um, an element in F and let FT denote polynomial ring with coefficients in F and variable T. And then look at the algebra defined by this quotient. Let E in curly X be the element corresponding to T then curly X is a geometric algebra of rank one. Okay, a typical element is the form A plus BE, where A and B and F and E squared equals eta. There are two cases to consider. So if the polynomial eta minus T squared is irreducible, so in other words, F doesn't contain the square root of eta, then curly X is the field extension. You take F and you add square root of eta. So it's another field. Uh, for instance, the obvious example is F equals R and eta equals minus one, then purely X is the complex numbers. If on the other hand, um, the square root of eta uh, belongs to F, then in other words, this is reducible, then curly X is not a field, in fact. No. Sorry? Um, these two are a pair of zero divisors. That you can work out. So the underlying vector space of both algebras is the same, but we will reserve the notation F squared, F plus F, for the latter one. Okay? And then we'll, re we'll use the notation F with square root of eta added for the other case. Okay? Now, supposing we've got two graded algebras, curly X and curly Y, and they can combine as the graded twisted tensor product. Um, so the nth part of X tensor Y is X, is the sum of XI tensor YJ, with sum up to N, okay? And multiplication, has a sign. So if A is in YI, B is in XJ and XY general, then there, this product here is minus one to the IJ times the products inside. Okay, so. <clears throat> then we can, we can write any geometric algebra as a twisted tensor product of rank one geometric algebras, x0 to x1, x2, et cetera, et cetera. So each xi is either, of, is either a field extension or is, as we say, f squared, this uh, funny algebra, which is not a field. So that's one way of looking at it. Um, and we've got two products, wedge and dot. Now, if you read the some of the papers on this, there's, there's, they, they define all sorts of products. But I mean, these are the ones which, which are really the important ones. 
and the most important one is the wedge or external product, which is due to Clifford and Graswell, or Grassman, I suppose. So the wedge product is an alternating bilinear form defined on basis vectors by EI wedge EJ is EIJ, putting the two things together. If, if their intersection is empty, otherwise it's zero. And then you extend it linearity. Once you know what the product is on basis elements, then you know what it is in general. Um, here's an example here. Supposing we've got U and V, they're in the, um, the, one, the one space, you know, the, the, the one vectors, then the product, the wedge product is given by this formula here. And here's a little interesting thing here that the, you can relate the wedge product of, um, of two, two one vectors, U wedge V is uh, the product which we've already seen, U V minus V U all divided by two. Um, and oh, here's a nice little exercise in linear algebra. Show that the set of one vectors, V1 up to VK is linearly independent if and only if their wedge product is not zero. Now, one way is obviously trivial. If any one of them is a combination of the others, then it's, it's clearly by alternating, it's gonna be zero. Um, but doing the other way around, um, well, uh, you need a little bit of linear algebra. Incidentally, uh, a set of vectors like this is um, for which the wedge product is not zero. Uh, is um, it's called a oh lost it. What is it? Um, a, a blade, a K blade. Now the dot product is the opposite of the wedge product. So it's instead of being anti-symmetric, it's symmetric. And it's defined on base vectors by, if I is J, then it's just Q I, the weight of I, um, and it's naught otherwise. So that all these um, under this dot product, everything, is all these basis elements are orthogonal. Um, and then the formula for the dot product is if the one vectors is given by the opposite of what we had before, u dot v is uv plus vu all over two. And <clears throat> Here's another little exercise. Supposing you've got any elements of an associated algebra show that the product x circle y, x y plus y x over two, satisfies the Jordan identity, which is this one. Um, and that's what you get with Jordan algebras. So that's just a little exercise. Um, I have no idea what it means. Um, I don't know anything about Jordan algebras, but anyway, there you go. Um, and you can also, instead of X circ Y, you can have X blob Y, which is X Y minus Y X over two. And yeah, you can see, does this satisfy the Jordan identity? Only you can find out. Uh, okay, now, um, <clears throat> we're going to define an automorphism, various automorphisms and anti-automorphisms. Now, alpha goes from a geometric algebra to a geometric algebra by 
changing the sign, it's going to be minus one to the number of elements in I. So for instance, alpha of, oh, that should be one of course there. So alpha of E1 is just minus E1, alpha of E12 is E12, and so on. The next one is minus, and so on. And then the transpose, which is an anti-automorphism, defined on basis elements by switching the order. So the transpose of EI1, EI2, up to EIK, is EIK, EIK minus one, down to EI1. And there's a formula for that because we can all move the things back so they're in the right order again, or the same order. Uh, but this will give you a sign, and it is um, the sign is minus one to uh, the number of elements in I choose two. And I didn't, I haven't got any further with this. If something's in F, then of course, lamb, then the, um, that's, I can tell I was just doing it just before we came on air. The transpose of lambda is lambda, um, and the transpose of E1 is just E1, of course. The transpose of E1, E2 is just E2, E1, which is minus E1, E2. And if you work that out, um, 2 choose 1 is 1, so it's minus 1 to the 1, which works out OK. And then the conjugate of an element X um, is alpha T, uh, alpha of X, and then transpose. So <clears throat> on basis elements, the, um, the conjugate of EI is minus one to the number of elements in I plus one, choose two times E i. Then the norm is defined to be x times x bar. And the norm is an anti-automorphism. Uh, uh, the, so the conjugate is reverses order and so does the norm. And You'd like to think that the norm of X is in F. Well, it is, but only for these cases. Um, and you can, as an exercise, find an X in GA such that the norm of X is not in F. But we will see soon, there is a situation where NX is in F. So exercise is nx equal to x bar x. Remember, we defined nx to be x x bar. Is it equal to x bar x? Find out. Uh, if u is in v, the norm of u is minus u squared is minus u dot u. Um, so we want some isometries. We start off with reflections. For one vector's uv, where u is invertible, the threefold product um, uv u inverse is also a one vector. And it's given by this formula here. And how do we get that? Evaluating the left product first. So we're using the fact that it's associative here. So uv, u inverse is, so uv is u dot v plus uh, u wedge v, which is uv minus v u over two, n times u inverse. 
multiplying that out, that's u, u dot v times u inverse plus u v u inverse over two minus v over two. And then if you gather all those terms together, you get this formula here. Note that if u dot u is not equal to naught, then u has this inverse and that lies in, I don't know why I've written it, curly x here, but anyway, the set of inverses in the algebra. On the other hand, u not equal to naught does not imply that u has an inverse in general. Let u be a one vector with an inverse, then there's a map row of u from v to v defined by this formula here uh, with a minus sign which is v minus 2 u dot v over u inverse uh, and because well uh, that's that's u dot u divided by u so i'm normalizing u here and then the following facts are easy to prove um, Row u is unaltered if u is multiplied by a non-zero scalar because it cancels out. Row of u is a linear map of v. Row u negates u. And row u is fixed on the subspace perpendicular to u. So the subspace perpendicular to u is all those v's for which u dot v is naught. And row u is an isometry isometry with respect to the dot product. Okay, so that's an exercise. So row u is reflection in the subspace orthogonal to u and is an element of OV, the group of isometries of V. Okay, so let... Um, well, let, let's continue with this. If I, if I let uv be a two-blade, okay, so u cross v is not naught, then I can do rho u, and now I can do rho v, because rho u, <coughs> if I think of rho u as going first, then that certainly preserves um, the one vectors, and so acting, so that doing rho v will also preserve one vectors, and the result I can write as rho uv. It's an element of the uh, orthogonal group of V and it's fixed on the intersection of the two subspaces which are perpendicular to U and V. So that's a sort of co-dimension two subspace. And um, if uh, F is the reals, um, standard example and Q is always one, then rho u v defines a rotation in Euclidean space about the co-dimension to subspace u perp intersection v perp through an angle equal to twice the angle between u and v. Two blade is often written as R and it's called a rotor. The physicists like to call it rotors and then the action is just this conjugation. Uh, so that's, remember that that looks like what happens at a, a pure quaternion. Remember a pure quaternion is a, is a two blade. Um, and if you, if you consider conjugation by a pure quaternion, it corresponds to a rotation of space. And you can go on like this, if you've got um, a K blade, um, then there should be a, another wedge there, then rho of W is B, W, B inverse. And so that's another element of the orthogonal group. <laughs> So, which brings me to subgroups. GA star, let's call that the invertible elements of GA. The smallest non-trivial subgroup is Q. 
the group generated by all the QIs. If Q is finite, then you'll remember from your Galois theory that Q must be cyclic and it will be of even order because it will always contain minus one. And so it's, uh, you can think of it as the roots of unity, the two case roots of unity. Uh, somehow that should too shouldn't be there. All right. <clears throat> and then I can throw in the E's as well, because they form a subgroup. Um, and so we've got QI times EJ, I is any index element of the index and J is any subset of I. Um, for example, consider GA3R, this is the standard, the one of our universe, when QE equals D4, group of symmetries of the square. You can check that for yourself and GA3R is the real group drawing of D4. And then the Clifford group, gamma, is defined to be all those invertible x's for which alpha x u times x inverse is also a one vector for all one vectors u. Okay. And then the special Clifford group is the intersection of the ordinary Clifford group with the, um, the even elements of GA. So, um, right, I think um, I'm going to prove one thing, and I think perhaps I'll finish there for today. Uh, it's a lot to take in. We've got um, we've got a map from gamma to the orthogonal group of B, which sends um, rho of x acting on U is, as I say, given by this formula, alpha of x U x inverse. And this is a very natty proof that the kernel of rho is F star. So let's suppose that X is in the kernel of rho. In other words, uh, rho will be the identity um, identity map. So uh, U goes to U. So if we multiply that out, we get alpha X times U is U times X. <coughs> now, write x as uh, an even bit plus an odd bit, okay? So that's a direct sum. And then what happens when I apply alpha x? Alpha, alpha of xe is just xe. Um, and so that's equal to, so that time u is u x e and x naught u is minus u x naught or x o because then the, uh, then you've got a change of sign. Now pick any i belong to i and let x, this even part here, be a plus b e i, where a and b do not involve e i. Now, because this is even, it means that A is also even, and B must be odd, because it's got an EI here, okay? Uh, and since EI is in V, all right, so uh, we know that X, the row of X acting on EI will send it to, um, uh, well, it's the identity, so we'll leave it as alone. Um, so we have that AEI plus QIB, so it's acting on it, is EIA plus EIBEI. Now getting that EI past the B will give a minus sign, and once it gets to here, it'll multiply together and make a QI, all right? So we get um, 
AEI minus QIB. But we've got a plus QIB here, and we know that all the QIs are non-zero, so it must be true that B is naught. And this is true for all I, so it must be that, um, that when we, that, that we, it doesn't, that this, this product here doesn't involve any EI. In other words, XE, uh, which is what um, X is, belongs to F star. And then similar argument shows that X odd is zero. Um, right. Um, so, what have we got here? We've got the kernel of this map here from gamma to OV is F star. And I also claim that this map is surjective. Um, I think I'm going to stop here for now. I know it's not quite a full hour, but it's to do with hyperplanes. And I want to explain that to you when you're fresh. So <laughs> are there any questions? So I take it from that. that um, you, you will, um, you'll send a, uh, some notes uh, I, of this around. I, I certainly will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, we have looked at a lot of um, a lot of references about geometric algebra. Do you have one that you particularly like by now that uh, you also might recommend to the group? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll I'll, uh, I'll make a list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. You have um, known rack structures among these uh, operations. Oh yes, yeah. We haven't got to that yet. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in fact, um, you can using this this algebra, you can define unitary solutions of the Yang-Baxter equation very very easily. Um, Roger, what's wrong yeah. with characteristic two? Well, the, you see, we've got to divide by two every so often. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know if anybody, anybody has considered it with characteristic two. Um, I don't know. Has anybody got any feelings about that? Um, I mean, for instance, we, we've had to use the, um, the sign here, so a lot. And if, um, if it was characteristic two, we'd lose all that information. Could you go back to the bit where um, you had the dihedral group uh, mentioned? Yeah. So, are there similar structures with dicyclic groups or with uh, uh, any of the other finite subgroups of SU2? Yeah, we did get a, we got a, we, we, we got this um, method of, of writing down um, what the group is, this, this group. Uh, where are we? Oh, I've seen, I think I've gone past it. Have I? It's a bit further on, I think. Yeah. Here we are. Yeah. So the QE, QE is D4. QE2 is D4. Okay. Yeah. And um, she'll be sure she'll be glad to know that. 
Queen Elizabeth is D4. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, yeah, we, we did work out a system. If you know, um, if you, if you know what the group is, you know, you can, you can, you can just consider the subalgebra generated by um, the e, EIs where I, I goes up to say three, and then you want to go to the next one, four. And then you could, there, there's a, a way of defining the next group in terms of the previous group. So, uh -huh. yeah. Um, I don't know how useful it is, but. Um, but the important group is the Clifford group. Um, and uh, well, next time I talk, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss more about the Clifford group. And then there's there's pin and spin and all sorts. Um, any other queries or questions? I mean, is anybody here an expert on this subject? Obviously not, or perhaps you're just too modest. <laughs> Maybe some people have used them, though. They might have corners of it that they yeah. would be interested yeah. in mm. contributing to if we were continuing this as yeah. a long series. Well, it, I do plan for it to be a long series, not, not just, just down to me. I'm hoping that uh, my fellow workers will, yeah. will say something, I'm sure. Lou would be happy to say something. But I'll, um, I'll, I'll say more about the Clifford group and pin and spin and so on um, next time I talk, which I don't know when that'll be, because um, next week uh, we're going to talk. It's, it's going to move it to Wednesday uh, because I have to go out on Tuesday. Oh. Um, oh, oh you is that minute. all right with you, Lou? Probably not. Just a moment. Uh, the twelfth. Um, no, no. This Wednesday is the twelfth. Twelve uh, plus seven is nineteen. Nineteen. Yeah, that's okay. So we're going to meet at eleven on the nineteenth. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And I hope that's okay for everyone else. And um, the speaker is going to be Jack Moreva. And then after that, we go back to a Tuesday. And I think Scott's going to talk. Yeah, that was my plan. Yeah. And then we'll see what happens after that. Mm -hmm. What are you going to talk about, Scott? Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some sections of this book that you all should buy to make CEG richer. I've bought it. <laughs> oh, how lovely of you. Thank you. <laughs> and Scott I, I is speaking. Read, this... I would just uh, look at the pictures myself, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'll be. Uh, I'll be talking in Lou's seminar, uh, which is Thursday at noon. 6 p.m. Uh, Greenwich Mean, right? Right, which is noon in Chicago time. Right. Okay, so if there are no more questions... Um... I'll stop recording and, um, and I'll see everybody uh, in a week and a day. Thank you, Roger. Thanks, Dale. <laughs> um, Great.